Okay, hello and uh, welcome members of the Chinese Medicine Practitioner Meetup Group uh, hosted by Campbell. Uh, my name is Thomas Leong. I'm the organizer and your host for this afternoon uh, or evening, depending if you're from the East Coast or the West Coast. Uh, I want to take a moment to welcome members to our group. I uh, hear you're in, um, I hope you're in, you enjoy what you, we have for you today and hopefully many more events in the future. Uh, the mission of our meetup group is to connect members with respective authorities on subject matters within our profession. The events are always free and our speaker suggestions come from you, the members. So if you have a suggestion for speakers, please send them to us. This is our 131st event, uh, but it's only our ninth uh, event uh, that is exclusively online uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, for those who are big fans of the live meetup uh, in the in-person events, uh, it, it will be resumed at some point. Um, however, because of the enormous reach of the online platforms, uh, we most likely will incorporate it into our in-person events uh, by live streaming it in the future. Uh, by attending tonight, each of you will receive a $20 coupon via email. So please look for that email coming from events at camera.com. Uh, especially look in your spam box if it's not in your inbox. Uh, tonight's uh, talk will be approximately 1.5 hours, so it will end about 8.30 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so here's some ground rules. Please uh, mute your microphones and hold off any questions until our guest speaker gives us the, the cue to, to ask the questions. And of course, uh, there will be a Q&A session toward the end. Uh, if there's something that's urgent and relevant, uh, please type your comments on the chat box and just raise your hand. And I, as your host, will address this. This way the lecture can go on uninterrupted. Uh, now, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker whose reputation in the profession precedes him. Heiner Fruhoff has researched Chinese culture and medicine for 42 years and holds a PhD from the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago. He is the founding professor of the College of Classical Chinese Medicine at National University of Natural Medicine in Portland, where he has taught and practiced since 1992. He lectures in North America, Europe, and China, and has authored a wide variety of articles and textbooks on Chinese medicine. His interest in preserving some of the traditional features of Oriental medicine has led him to develop a database dedicated to the archiving of classical knowledge, where a selection of his publications can be accessed through classicalchinesemedicine.org. His strong belief in clinical efficacy of Chinese herbal medicines led him to find the Healing Order, a wellness center in the Columbia River Gorge specializing in the treatment of difficult and recalcitrant diseases out of concerns over the rapidly declining quality of medicinals from mainland China, he has found the company Classical Pearls that specializes in the import of wildcraft and sustainably grown Chinese herbs, classicalpearls.org. Now, without further ado, I will turn it over to our esteemed speaker, Heiner Fruho. Mm. Welcome. Thank you, Thomas, for the nice introduction here. And thank you all of you for not only being here in the evening uh, of probably a busy work day, um, but also for inviting me. I uh, appreciate that very much. Um, I will be speaking about, yeah, really uh, about something that I've been thinking about the last few years uh, more and more. Namely, what is it that heals in Chinese medicine? What is it that we're doing when we are um, stimulating, when we put a needle into somebody, when we are using herbs, uh, you know, because we are so, even at the university that is technically um, dedicated to natural holistic <clears throat> medicine that uh, technically has some traditional connotations, there's, it's more, I find like it's this never ending search for new superfoods that affect like one little part of the body. Like you're deficient in DHEA, you gotta give DHEA. You 
you uh, have SIBO, you got to, you know, hammer that person to get rid of the whatever the offending pathogen is. Uh, or, you know, some fads like resveratrol or, you know, and it's the same thing as, so that's the benefit of, of this medicine is that it is timeless. There is all of that ancient wisdom. And instead of waiting for something to happen in the future, most of everything that needed to be said has already been said and it's all written down. And our problem is not that we don't have enough information. There's really, the record is too huge to tackle in one lifetime. And so, uh, it's I count myself lucky that there's you know like it never gets boring and you have these two books that you're reading all the time one thing is nature the other one is your diseases of your patients and then number three there's this written record where you again and again you read the same maybe quotation in the Neijing or so but there is or in the Shanghai Lun and there's like something new that pops up to the surface that particularly now post COVID becomes super clear what they were talking about because you have a much different uh, relationship to it now that you've seen patients like that. I'm going to share my screen here. Hopefully you can see that now. All right, I will do my best to uh, keep to my promise of having part theory. What is uh, ministerial fire? What is that mysterious uh, prenatal energy that keeps us going? And how do we treat that, particularly with Chinese herbs, which is more of my expertise in comparison to acupuncture? And I'll start with a preview of cosmology and history and theory, and then go into the uh, you know, some of my own experience, particularly with autoimmune disease, with COVID, but uh, just want to make sure I have the concept clear and I will try and regulate myself to not uh, stay with the theory for too long, but that's really what an interesting part is. I always find like Chinese medicine is more than just a bag of tricks and techniques, but there is this incredible, brilliant information there that is in the reflect for a, a lifetime there. All right, so uh, some of you know that I've one of my best friends and colleagues and constant, uh, you know, uh, ping pong partners in discussing Chinese medicine <laughs> is uh, Liu Linghong, the author of Classical Chinese Medicine, uh, who I've known for several decades. We share a shifu together. And uh, we often discuss similar topics. So one topic he's been talking about the last few years is this concept of zhong. What is the, you know, the center of Chinese culture, really? Of course, uh, China is called zhongguo, so the central country. Our medicine is called zhongyi, the central medicine. And in a certain way, it means more than just the medicine of China in comparison to the medicine that was imported from the West but it also means it is a medicine that always seeks to stimulate that center inside of us that knows how to heal. And so it's not about squelching viruses or you know, tonifying deficiencies or giving minerals that are not there, but it is having all of these billions of processes in the human body work together as one fed by this magical battery that's at the center of our being. Okay? So uh, there are, of course, different centers. And you know, in a certain way, we could say the Huang uh, Di Neijing itself, you know, if you take the character yellow, Huang, for the yellow emperor, and then uh, the kind of character Nei is another way of saying Zhong, uh, you could really translate that as the central emperor's classic and how to animate the body's central healing powers. And the important statement therein, no matter what you do, you want to look for the source. You never want to just treat the, 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 the surface and suppress symptoms, but uh, always seek the center. So what is this center? 
Uh, I just mentioned uh, my colleague Liu Li Hong. He, we've translated two of his books in recent years, and particularly in the second one, uh, The Yellow Emperor's Inner Transmission of Acupuncture, uh, he, in his own prophet, preface, as well as myself and my preface, we talk a lot about this concept of the center, but I'm expanding it here uh, quite a bit in this uh, presentation. Um, the, this was a sentence that is, you know, got incredibly important for us, particularly at COVID times. Zheng Qi Cun Nei Xie Bu Ke Gan, Chapter 72 of the Neijing, Bi Qi Du Qi, when righteous qi is strong on the inside, pathogenic influences cannot invade from the outside. And of course, while that's our source, we want to do our best to evade toxic qi, you know, by, I don't know, uh, kind of uh, uh, um, isolating ourselves or something like that. But it's really, uh, so much about the how do we strengthen our immune qi on the inside. So this zheng qi, this righteous qi, that is sort of the, the topic here. What, what is the righteous qi? How does that come from? How do we nourish that? Um, what organs are in charge of administrating that? Um, in my own cosmology research, uh, I found that the 12 organ uh, systems of Chinese medicine are naturally, uh, when you decode the code, they are organized in three groups. They are basically heaven, earth, and humanity, as all uh, threeness is usually divided into, right? This is the organ clock starting with the lung on the left. Not only going with the time from 3 to 5 a.m., followed by the large intestine from 5 to 7 a.m., sunrise by the stomach from 7 to 9 a.m., followed by the spleen from 9 to 11 a.m., but it's, of course, also the originally in the Neijing didn't talk about how the organs are uh, particularly uh, active at particularly hours of the day, but they said that organs belong to the months of the year. It doesn't say what organs go with what months, but then later when during the Yuan dynasty, a thousand years later, um, you know, the system emerged of attributing organ function to particular hours of the day. The day is of course a mini version of the entire year. We can, uh, conclude, you know, that that was the order, especially since the meridians are in this order, right? Going from the lung as the first meridians to the large intestine as the second meridian to the stomach as the third meridian to the spleen as the fourth meridian. So we have this um, uh, organ sequence, so lung going with the first months of the year, uh, you know, of course, in five element, it also goes with fall but it also here in the most ancient way goes with the first months of uh, spring. And we don't have enough time here to get into the philological details in, in, in showing exactly why that is. Um, uh, but that's sort of my main research topic as above, so below, what is Chinese alchemy? Uh, the body microcosm is working to, it, you know, just like the macrocosm, outside of us. That was Han Dynasty's thinking when all these classics were written. And so if we have this organ clock in this order, uh, then what we have is, you know, metal is next to metal, lung, large intestine, earth is next to earth, stomach, spleen, fire is next to fire, etc. So all of the five elements are in uh, bunched together as pairs. And then also the six confirmations are also expressed in the same order. We've got Yang Ming, large intestine is next to Yang Ming stomach. And uh, Tai Yang, uh, small intestine is next to Tai Yang bladder. Uh, Shao Yang organs are next to each other. And then the Yin organs, they sort of loop around in, in, in parallel fashion. 
And then you basically have three independent groups that are sort of intertwined, five element and six conformations like this. And if you look at them, they are the three major centers of the human body. And we discover, you know, like if we say heaven, earth, and humanity, of course, uh, heaven that is needs to be the group with the heart, earth needs to be the group with the digestive organs, the respiratory organs. So our animal, the earth organs, that's our animal body that has the poor spirits in it, that's animal instincts, is makes us run fast and react instinctively and digest our food and breathe. And uh, that is a center that all of us in school uh, get taught a lot. Everything resolves a lot around that. Same in naturopathic school or Western and chiropractic, because it's all about nutrition. It's about exercise. It's about colonics. It's about all of this fiddling around with our animal bodies in essence. And um, the the uh, but this is only one third of our and it's the lowest part of our body. We also have these so-called heaven and humanity organs. Uh, group starts with the heart and ends with the kidney. That's of course imperial fire, and then we have this other group that starts with the pericardium and ends with the liver here on the lower right. That is a ministerial fire. So let's. And so while Li Dongyuan, of course, with his Pi Wei Lun uh, treatise of the spleen and stomach at the end of the Song Dynasty, uh, you know, kind of uh, created the kind of TCM herbalism that we have nowadays with Ren Shen and Huang Qi and Gan Sao and Fu Ling, this kind of Si Jun Zetang, Liu Jun Zetang, four gentlemen, six gentlemen approach. Um, that's also been absorbed into Western uh, herbalism. There is deeper centers in the body that are even more relevant and that are particularly in a situation like COVID, we see how tremendously important that is. Um, so in the Neijing itself, there is this important sentence in chapter 66, right? Jun huo yi ming, xiang huo yi wei. The imperial fire functions by illuminating above, of course, and the ministerial fi fire functions by positioning below. So it's a little bit like imperial fire is like the light of a candle. It it you can't hide it underneath a bushel. You need to put it in the room, and it's that fire at the top that brightens everything up. Whereas if I want to boil a pot of water, that fire needs to be below the pot. Otherwise, there will be no boiling happening. And so it, the imperial fire, in other words, is kind of, you know, is, is, is outside of a physical three-dimensional space, whereas ministerial fire is a type of fire that is different from the postnatal qi of the yin qi, of the spleen and the wei qi of the lung. <clears throat> that is sort of a prenatal force inside of us um, that is yet different from this, uh, you know, the, 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 the fire of our mind that uh, in our heart that, that uh, connects us to spiritually also to the universe at large. So this is sort of the connection between the two fires we always see, but both in Ayurvedic medicine, as well as in Buddhism, Hinduism, is this connection of, you know, that goes through the center of our body from the lower chakras to the higher chakras. That is that connection of these two fires working together. And the all familiar with the cultivation of the upper fire in Buddhism and particularly Confucianism, particularly dedicated to the cultivation of that fire, right? Uh, uh, here is also, you know, here's a Buddhist example, Thich Nhat Hanh and uh, Buddhist teachings. Here's Wang Feng Yi, um, also introduced to the mainland Chinese, reminding everybody that there was such a Confucian teacher of the heart mind, uh, working with imperial fire exclusively to uh, no needles, no herbs, just working with human 
uh, uh, illumination of the imperial fire uh, 100 plus years ago in uh, what used to be Manchuria at the time. Uh, in the Shanren Dao uh, concept, the path of the good or the way of the good person, right? Um, music is another way of cultivating imperial fire. There is, uh, right in the, the Confucian temple, there is like part of the classic education was like uh, how to influence very much like Pythagoras in Greece, how do you make people, you remind them of the goodness inside of them by make them co-resonate with the vibrations with the positive vibrations in the universe. That's why every, you know, Bach playing in the church and, you know, there was the spirituality often goes with music, particularly uh, different traditions of classical music, because there is this direct vibrational uh, trying to get our imperial fire to co-resonate and remember uh, the purity of, you know, how we are one with the universe. And uh, yeah, here are the famous bells, right? They also go, interestingly, we have a 12 tone system. You know, I have the pentatonic system, but with the half tones in between, both in East West, we have 12 tones and they go, lo and behold, they also go with the 12 months of the year and they go with the 12 meridians of the body. So each meridian has a particular bell, has a particular pitch standard, uh, right? The Charlu, the 12 pitch standards, are uh, cosmologically related uh, to the 12 meridians of the body. The Confucian ritual of archery, of stilling the heart mind that's still practiced in J Japan was very important in pre-Han dynasty times, 500, 400, 300 BC. It was like, basically you would be made a noble man if you were able to hit the bullseye because it's a reflection of your inner ability to be centered, you know? So uh, it was a manifestation of your nobility, but also a training of your ability to center. So all of these are kind of imperial fire ex exercises and cultivational methods that are built into the pre-medical cultural background of China uh, that are found everywhere in the classics. Meditation, of course, but meditation, there's different ones. You know, the Buddhist meditation tends to manifest more on the imperial fire, um, emptiness meditations, and the Taoist meditation is more focused on ministerial fire, which it resides in the lower Danqian. So that's why at some point this phrase Xing Ming Shuang Xiu came about that when you cultivate, you need to have dual cultivation of not just Xing, which is like this imperial fire, heavenly nature that you, the, the positivity, the place where we all the same, the place where we all good. And then Ming uh, is more an, a, a, an earthly fire that is also individual, right? That has to do with genetics and that has to do not just genetics as in father and mother and ancestors on earth, but it has to do with genetics of, of time and space. Where was I born? Uh, where, what was the heavenly stems and the earthly branches at the moment that I was born? So time and space uh, are sort of like an imprint together with the genetics of mother and father that influence our mean. And whether it is due, due to a modern genetic test or whether it's due to Bazi Xuan Ming, which is the name for Chinese astrology, <coughs> the individual quality of that, of why we like to be an artist versus a scientist or why we like Chinese things versus Japanese things or African things, or why we, uh, get angry while other people get sad when they get triggered, etc. All of these are, or while we get psoriasis when uh, when other people don't get that, or they get a mess or something when we have an autoimmune disease. All of these are Ming related, in, um, and and Ming of course is uh, has that term Ming Men, the vital <laughs> the vital gate of life, going with ministerial fire. So the, 
the center that is formed by imperial and ministerial fire uh, and their interaction is sort of, you know, one more timeless and uh, non-individual and the other one highly individual, but both of them being prenatal uh, is sort of a concept we don't talk enough about in Chinese medicine where everything is about the spleen and the stomach and the lung and postnatal qi and, and, and that sort of thing. But it is that, you know, the mystery of um, how does a cell divide? How are, is it that we can procreate and we can uh, carry babies to maturity? And how is it when I get afflicted with a pestilential fever that my body knows uh, what to do? And uh, what goes wrong when it doesn't know what to do, but starts freaking out like in the life-threatening COVID situations where people go into the cytokine storm scenario, that's all Mingmen fire uh, going, uh, ministerial fire uh, going rampant. So, uh, so in ancient times, there was this dual cultivation of these two things, imperial and ministerial fire, that was important. Um, so uh, I'm a cosmologist by, I don't want to say by training, it's more uh, by interest. And that means before I look at the human body, I like to look at the, 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 the precepts of those concepts that ancient medical scholars were using for the human body. What were those concepts used for, in nature first? So uh, of course, there is this you know, the chart I showed you is like these 12 meridians. That's all one chi, just like in nature, it's all one chi. And it, the yin yang of our postnatal universe is heaven and earth, right? So we've got the matter of earth that gets fertilized by the vibration and the radiation and the life giving spirit energy consciousness that streams down from the universe itself out of empty space and that's why the character Tian here on the left uh, was in originally written in some versions like what you see on the right it's this kind of energy that comes down but that energy again was you know this kind of heavenly fire that is also described in the Yijing as uh, the light of sun moon and stars is again divided into, um, into uh, different orientations. So what is imperial fire in the heavens is of course the sun. You know, all ancient people, they, you know, the heart goes with fire, fire goes with south, all ancient Chinese buildings they were facing and are still facing south toward the light, toward the sun, toward the yang qi because that is positivity itself and uh, nourishes us and all of us are eager to uh, uh, experience that uh, and be exposed to that. You know, when, when particularly in the Pacific Northwest where until yesterday it's been raining and was cold relentlessly when everywhere else it was 105 degrees, we've been wearing sweaters and even down jackets still or so. Uh, some people say that's a good thing, uh, better than fire seasons, but uh, nevertheless, we we craving here the, when the sun finally comes. So from very ancient times, from the beginning of the Xia dynasty, we know that the houses are uh, oriented on this north-south axis for almost 4,000 years now, since the beginning of dynastic China. And even the character Qi, as we can see here in Oracle Bone versions of that, and we can, see, we can see is like basically radiation coming down from the sun. And uh, the character, the Qian Gua, right? The, 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 the character Qian for the, the trigram name and the hexagram name, hexagram one in the, the I Ching is that's basically the same ancient form of Qi as well. But that means, Yang Qi, right? So uh, chapter three in the Neijing says, you know, like the Yang Qi is just like heaven, is just like the sun. Uh, everything will wither and die without that. 
you know, uh, and that's why we orient, you know, all of the, not just Chinese culture as a whole, but ancient cultures like Egypt and other places, always there's lots of solar, quote unquote, worshiping and description and uh, ritualistic uh, rituals uh, around the solstices, etc., and the return of the light. Uh, happy solstice, by the way. Uh, which is, of course, today, summer solstice. Um, the ancient versions of the qi written, as I just showed you, in modern terms would be written like this, more like the jian ti zi, the simplified form. And that character actually nowadays still has meaning and means to beg. So in a certain way, it means everything on earth, this is real nutrition, more than anything else, more than vitamin C, more than protein. This is what nothing on earth can live without that. We are all begging for this nutrition, right? That's uh, this chi or this solar emanation. And even the character Chan, which is uh, uh, in modern writing, has that written inside of it and also has the sun written inside of it, hexagram one, there. Uh, now, as above, so below. So before we come to the human body, there is always like something that is sort of like a solar center of the heart in the body resonates with the southern fire inspired spirit light energy, then on earth, what is the equivalent and the central one of the Taoist mountains was Mount Sung, where the Shaolin Monastery is located. And uh, in the cosmology I was studying, there's a lots of mythology. You know, Mount Sung is in southern China, in 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 Henan. Of course, this is from the view of the ancient Chinese, where Guangdong and Guangxi. Uh, 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 and Yunnan, those kind of provinces that were barbarian countries in the south and southwest. So uh, southern China in ancient time was what's now Henan province. So this is was sort of a solar center, also going with the heart, going with the south uh, mountain. The how about the northern center that goes that then would go more with the ministerial fire? Uh, that it now becomes interesting because the this is the center that is associated with this Taoist concept of Wu Wei of nothingness. You know, like we will find in the cosmology that this is not a visible center. This is an invisible center from which, however, emanate the most powerful energy, maybe even more powerful for our physical body than the sun itself. And so uh, the sun is a uplifting energy for our spirit, you know, whereas this is like electricity recharge energy for our Mingmen, for our ministerial fire. So due north, the sun was important. The sun, of course, moves around in the south, so you can't really orient your house toward that. So the ancient Chinese were actually orienting their houses due north, which is toward the pole star, toward the dipper, which is in the center of the known uh, visible universe to the ancient observers, not just the Chinese, but the Sumerians and the Egyptians. and everyone who came behind them. And so there is this general fascination with the Big Dipper, right, which is at the center of the sky and is turning around and pointing at different times at different stellar constellations. And as we see where the axle of the Dipper is pointing, we know what time it is in the round of the year, right? But um, I'm going to maybe come back to this later, I'll skip this for now. I guess it doesn't want to want me to skip. This is a swarm of starlings, um, which I always use to illustrate. This is literally a million starlings over Rome and none of them fall down. You know, this is how ministerial fire or our cells work in the human body is 
everything moving as one. And that is what we're treating in a certain way. We don't treat a single bird and try and kill it or influence it or so. We're trying to have all of these things move together as one. Um, so that is why there is this fascination in Taoism and Zhuangzi, right? Everything is about hold on to the one, hold on to the center, don't get lost in the many. So that is in a certain way, this seeking the center, you know, working with this uh, connection between ministerial and uh, imperial fire. And of course the imperial fire is hard to reach, you know, that's meditation, prayer, ritual, music. Uh, it's these kind of, you know, cultivation of the heart mind, whereas ministerial fire we can reach is a physical fire that is located in time and space and incredibly important for our physical health. And uh, this is the, the crux of our time that this has for the most part been uh, what we've seen with COVID also, there is an explosion of apparent uh, ministerial fire uh, spinning out of control, okay? Um, so of course here is Han Dynasty and before sort of like these images of the dipper and the, the emperor of the sky is riding in the dipper. Um, uh, so there is this relationship between central power of the universe and the dipper. But the dipper of course is near the north, due north, but is not entirely north. And so uh, David Pankanir, uh, the very respected Sinologist wrote this very good book, Astrology and Cosmology in Early China. And in there, he has a chapter on the character Di, as in Huang Di, right, for Yellow Emperor or any emperor, and also for Shang Di, as you know, the Supreme Lord who writes in the in the Dipper. And he said, actually, from his based on his research, the character D for Emperor or Supreme Lord or God, as the missionaries. Uh, translated that, the Jesuit missionaries who came to China in the 1600s, he said was actually the original character was in the shape of a measuring device that the Xia and Shang dynasty and maybe Zhou dynasty people were using to locate due north, you know, by putting it on different stellar constellations. Uh, but that because 4,000 years ago, the center of the visible universe due to what's called procession of the equinoxes was empty. And therefore this recognition and fascination of ancient Chinese with that the biggest power is located in the empty space. You know, all of this Wu Wei and wishing, no, you know, everything that's shapeless and non-doing versus doing and invisible versus visible, uh, non-palpable versus palpable, being on a higher plane uh, comes from that. We find that also a symbolic description of what I just told you in the sentence in the Tao Te Ching that says, San shi fu gong yi gu dang qi wu yu che zhe yong, right, where it says 30 spokes come together to form a hub. It is, however, the emptiness of the central space that makes it useful. What are the 30 spokes around the hub is a metaphor of the 28 constellations plus sun and moon that are around this empty galactic center where, as we now know, uh, the, the biggest black hole in our galaxy resides and where most radio waves come streaming from. Okay, so that is the heavenly Mingmen that is in the north, where all, um, where we all, every earthly great creature is getting its energy from, and spiraling source energy comes from here. And uh, this kind of shape, you know, of having this spiraling source energy from an empty center, for instance, that the eye of the hurricane is like that also. You've got this visible palpable action on the inside, but then this stillness 
at the center, you know, so just as we have this situation in the universe, in, in the galactic in the galaxy, then lots of earthly phenomena are mirroring and manifesting uh, this uh, situation. Um, the want to remind everybody also that the original Taiji Tu, the Taiji symbol, is not just yin and yang two things, but there is this center that that emerges from yin yang emerging from the uh, Wuji, uh, the nothingness center, and uh, there this, uh, and then of course we have in the Huangdi Neijing chapter thirty there is this chapter on Juichi, and Jue is the same Jue as the gallbladder making a decision, but it really originally means spiraling source energy. Uh, and so this is sort of like that chapter, if you read it with those lenses on, is a description of, you know, the spiraling so source energy in the cosmos that is then manifested in the Mingmen in our body that then manifests in all kinds of different phenomena like Jing essence, like Qi, like Jin fluids, like sheer blood. Etc. But they all emerge from this one, one, one prenatal source uh, that then differentiates itself into all of these other kind of uh, prenatal uh, phenomena. Um, now, here is something very interesting in this very good book, which I can greatly recommend from the Han Dynasty, written approximately at the time that the Neijing was written. Um, uh, the Chun Xiu Fan Lu, Heavy Dew on the Spring and Autumn Annals, translated a couple of years ago by a team of Sinologists. Uh, it's language very similar to the Neijing and in there, uh, it talks a lot about the five elements, particularly particularly the earth element, the importance of the heart, et cetera. It's a Confucian book. It has a lot of medical content. He says, how is the movement of yang qi in the universe? It says the yang qi starts in the center in the north and then stops expanding in the center in the south. And so he is literally using the term center. He says that there are, in the universe, there's two centers and those two centers are the winter and the summer solstice. So that is where our, uh, uh, and one of course associated with south, <laughs> the other one with north. So they're in the microcosm that's, that is the uh, imperial fire going with the heart at the top and ministerial fire going with the gallbladder, which is located at the bottom. The gallbladder is also in chapter eight called the Zhongzheng Zhuguan, right? It's called the, we always remember it has something to do with decision making, but actually it has that character Jue. So that means that the officer of central power spiraling source energy emerges here, right? The, the, the Neijing says, the, the gallbladder is not some organ you can cut out, but it's the organ that on the holo map sits on the winter solstice and is due north <laughs> and therefore, and, and it is associated with this character Ju, similar to this Ju Qi in the Neijing. So the spiraling source power emerges from here. And then what kind of officer is it? So Zheng as in righteous qi and Zheng as in center. So there is, it's not just the heart that is a center, not just the spleen stomach, but the gallbladder in a certain way is the center of all reachable centers. It is the heart of the ministerial fire, even more than the kidney is. And I, uh, there is even a Zheng Zheng officer that's been shown in movies. It's sort of like this rectifier in the second century when the Neijing was still being uh, edited. Um, so I want to go a little faster so that we are, you know, that's the, the reason why also it says in the Neijing chapter nine, 
the gallbladder is the boss of the organ networks. You know, that is something we never hear in modern times anymore. Uh, gallbladder with together with the triple warmer is Shaoyang, right? Shaoyang is ministerial fire. So it's this northern source fire. And we have entire Stone Age, you know, kind of rituals like here in New Grange, Ireland, devoted to the spectacle of the winter solstice and how a beam of light only on that day and the day before and the day after is reaching the grave changer, reenacting in that building the rebirth of the light at the day, at the three days of the winter solstice. Uh, that's still visible today. There are 50,000 people applying every year to witness this kind of rebirth of the light uh, that in the body, the gallbladder is in charge of, you know, more than the kidney, more than anything else. Here you see the gallbladder located on the whole map at the very bottom uh, in that, in that uh, next to it, the triple warmer, uh, you know, and it's situated at the, the winter solstice. Um, yeah, here is right. So the stellar constellations that are mentioned here that go with this region of the sky when the sun, where the sun is in the winter solstice, uh, that is exactly where the galactic center is for both the triple warmer as well as for the gallbladder. You know, they are located in the ninth and the tenth, uh, the tenth and eleventh months of the lunar year. So the months of the winter solstice gallbladder and the months before from November 5th to December 5th, the triple warmer and the stellar constellation sort of approximately uh, Capricorn and Sagittarius, they are that they are around that galactic center, which is uh, where we know is this due north or where that place that the ancient people was the empty space at that time due to possession of the equinoxes uh, where the biggest and most powerful black hole that our whole galaxy revolves around is located. And as of a couple of years ago, we managed to with special uh, sensors photograph the, uh, the electromagnetic radio waves coming out of a black hole. If that doesn't look like how we would imagine a Mingmen to look, I don't know what does, you know. Um, so this is also, you know, includes the concept of the adrenals, like, uh, literally the Lisha Jen especially puts the gallbladder uh, the, the, or what we recognize the, as the adrenal tissues, he associates with Shaoyang and of ministerial fire and, uh, Mingmen. Um, Starling, okay. Everything I was preparing until the last second. So some of my slides here got mixed up a little bit. So Lisha Jen has a lot to say, the great genius of the 1600s writing the Ben Sao Gang Mu. He has a lot of things to say about ministerial fire and he links it exclusively. Not, you know, he's literally contradicting the Nanjing and says it's a mistake to exclusively link that to the right kidney. He says this is actually, you know, like we need to, uh, you know, while the kidney is, of course, involved, it is, <laughs> you keep forgetting about the triple warmer and the gallbladder uh, uh, being the most important part of ministerial fire. And he then says, other than defining these organs, also he ropes the bladder into that as well. But um, he is saying, I don't want to bore you with these details here. Um, you know, he's this, by the way, this imagery of the due north stellar constellations uh, called Genwu, the true warrior, is the snake wrapped around the turtle's neck. The turtle is more sort of a image of kidney energy in the five element system. And then the snake is the Shaoyang energy, which is the, you know, that energy circulating in the triple warmer, uh, being ignited by the gallbladder to like a spark plug, and then being sent into the triple warmer to course through the body, 
inject not just postnatal energy, but prenatal energy to heal everything and uh, regenerate everything is this mysterious prenatal energy that uh, is uh, unique to each one of us since it's different in each one of us. That's why some people have autoimmune disease, others don't. Uh, but um, so the gallbladder is one of the organs, not just the stomach, not just the large intestine, not just the lung, the metal organs, being in charge of down, the, while the liver here in Huang Yun Yu's graph uh, is wood upwards, he has the gallbladder as a major organ that is downwardly oriented. So the meaning that the gallbladder is assisting kidney water to constantly kind of being compressed into the, the kidney chi, going into making sure the battery of the ministerial fire of the Mingmen is being charged. And so ministerial fire has a tendency to rise up when it is triggered either by trauma or by a virus, for instance, and then roam through the body and cause all kinds of damage, okay? So a lot of stuff like high blood pressure, but also uh, bradykine storms, cytokine storms in a acute COVID patients, as well as unstoppable kind of, you know, brain inflammation in a Parkinson's patient or MS patients, all of that is from an ancient perspective, inability of kidney and gallbladder and, you know, like ministerial together, storing that ministerial fire in the lower dantian, but it kind of freaking out and leaking out of that battery instead of doing something healing and reproductive, it is causing tremendous damage and burning everything in its path, you know. Uh, and uh, we've seen that in the pandemic. We, we, I've seen, you know, hundreds of cases of uh, with bizarre symptoms. Uh, I should say both post COVID, acute COVID, but also post vaccination. That spike protein seems to aggravate the 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 ministerial fire and unleashes it to kind of freak out in some people, not in all people. But that's why it's Ming, right? That is some people have a different Ming, a different destiny, a different proclivity than others. Um, so Alicia Jen here says, uh, the Xianghuo, the ministerial fire, is has a tendency, you know, if it's physiological, we call it ministerial fire, but if it's pathological, we can translate that or render that as a kind of yin hua, kind of pathological fire that is lurking in the background and keeps smoldering and burning us, okay? And so there is this whole concept and that's, you know, why he says, what is a typical herb for Xiaoyang? And we know that is a chai hu. When it is in a state of acute being riled up, it says, so he says the Bupalurum is an herb that balances out and gets out of freak out mode the ministerial fire that resides in this lower group. You know, not the triple warmer by itself, not the gallbladder in itself, but also their associated sung organs, pericardium and liver. So he says, Bupalurum balances out basically free warming, unbalanced, minist triggered ministerial fire that produces acute symptoms in the liver, gallbladder, triple warmer, and pericardium. And that is exactly what it does. And that is exactly why during COVID, at the beginning, especially, but even now, uh, for reasons I'll mention shortly, the chai hu is an incredibly important herb, you know, but it's not a taiyang herb, it's a shaoyang herb, which means it affects ministerial fire. Does it recharge the battery? No, it is when the battery is leaking and there is freak out, it kind of uh, recalibrates everything and then we can recharge, for instance, with Di Huang Romania, for instance, with Huang Bai Philodendron, for instance, with Fuzi, uh, 
depending on how hot or cold or dry or, or, or moist the patient is. So here, the Schumann Dictionary has something else that's interesting. It says, uh, there are two words for disease, namely G and Bing. The G is the first character, Bing is the second here. And uh, the first one is when guest G from the outside invades us, that's called G. That's like originally a character of an arrow hitting us. But Bing means, sounds like another word for, for that's also pronounced Bing, which means lumped together. So the main word for disease actually means lumped togetherness. And what is it that is lumped together is some external chi coming in, lumping together with our zheng chi, which as we've already defined is a Shaoyang ministerial fire chi, and then keeps roaming through the body in this lumped together fashion. Why is it idiotic for us, therefore, to focus alone on killing off some kind of virus uh, or avoiding that virus, be it um, COVID or the regular flu virus or anything else, when our bread and butter is alchemy, is combination of external and internal, is what does that virus do or what does that food do when it comes into our body how does it amalgamate with our constitution? That is what decides uh, how our body reacts to it. Whether we have no symptom with COVID, whether we have a little bit of symptoms, whether we have problems in the brain or in the heart or in the lung, or whether we have life-threatening symptoms. That is defined by the nature and deficiency status of our a ministerial fire more so than what kind of variant of virus it is on the outside. And so Western medicine has no theory about that, hardly. There is a lot of lot of written about the nature of ministerial fire and Mingmen in Chinese medicine. Why is this important? And why are so many people getting sick right now? Because not only is the entire yun of the last few years has Shaoyang imbalance, but right now, Shaoyang is in the heavens. According to Wu Yin Qi, Shaoyang is on the earth. I'm talking March, May 21st to July 21st. So there is that, that and, and, and the guest Qi is also Shaoyang. So it's Shaoyang, Shaoyang, Shaoyang. So there is some excess, you know, Shaoyang pathology in nature right now uh, that then riles up uh, that Shaoyang pathology in people. That doesn't mean we all need to give pleurum to people quite uh, the, uh, not necessarily, but if there's an acute situation, then that might be a good idea. Um, yeah, Fever School talks about that a lot, you know, the importance of the triple warmer and how your own Mingmen fire gets riled up during epidemic diseases. Uh, the, uh, in a certain way, the whole you know, Ye Tian Shi discussion of febrile and uh, epidemic disease is on the triple warmer and its involvement. You know, that epidemic disease is not just a regular flu. What is a regular flu? Tai Yang. And then it stays there and we sweat it out and be done. Whereas epidemic disease means it goes in super quickly into all three Yang channels and definitely affects the Shaoyang and then it affects ministerial fire. And now we have complication because that fire is doing weird things in our body that we normally don't see. You know, maybe only once in a generation or so uh, that everybody all of a sudden falls ill with these basically autoimmune problems. Uh, the concept of Fuxie that uh, Bob Floss also has uh, written about that was orig originated by Jiang Bao Su is, uh, you know, basically talking about ministerial fire in an epidemic situation running rampant. And uh, he says, what you need to do is not only using antiviral things like Bupleurum and Lonisra for Scythia on the outside and poor area, but you need to Fujian. You need to kind of consolidate ministerial fire, consult, support the righteous Qi. Otherwise you're never going to uh, uh, make a difference there, okay? So that's the difficulty that Western medicine now has with post-COVID, uh, doesn't know what to do with that, right? Um, 
so that's why he says, therefore, as long as the gen qi is not in a state of deficiency, that despite the fact that submerged pathogenic qi may be severe, the disease can be treated and treatment results will be swift and complete. So the only worry is that the gen qi is deficient. So that's why I say, no, let's focus, like Liu Li Hung said, let's focus not so much on the virus in this situation, but building up people's righteous qi, which is not just postnatal astragalus kind of chi, but is prenatal ministerial fire chi. And so the way how we do that acutely to kind of disperse that invasion that, you know, is with remedies like that, you know, that we've been using a lot during COVID that Jiang Bao Su was already using 200 years ago. Uh, you know, if it's, you know, uh, uh, plurum, uh, particularly Xiao Chai Hu Tang and Chai Ge Jie Ji Tang, and Chaihu Gui Zhe Ganjiang Tang, we've been using for the last two years, but also now, particularly during Omicron, Wendan Tang, which is another not Bupluram based way to address the, the, the triple warmer uh, acute fire causing mischief, particularly headache and nausea that comes with, uh, uh, you know. But um, so here is, you know, sort of, a, I was ambitious, thought we could cover all of this. So this is sort of things we did during the pandemic here, but I, this is really what I wanted to get to. These three herbs, Huang Bai Philodendron, Di Huang, Romania, and Fuzi Aconite. You know, so Huang Bai is not just an herb that clears heat in the lower burner, uh, but is discussed in the Shandong Ben Sao Qing and then later, <laughs> in the Ben Cao Gang Mu as an herb that consolidates uh, ministerial fire, consolidates the kidneys. And um, particularly if it is salt fried. And so there is that, right? This is a very interesting, right? It's this tree bark. So that makes it totally different from Huang Qin and Huang Lian, which work, uh, you know, more with a clearing excess Yang Ming fire extremely useful herbs, but there is something special about Huang Bai, which is also described more as a salty herb rather than a bitter herb, and uh, therefore has less heat clearing as more kind of consolidating uh, kidney qi. And that's why I got very interested in this approach by the fire spirit school, uh, Feng Sui Dan, you know, consolidate the essence palette. When you look at it, there is no Di Huang, there is no Fu Zi, there is no, horny goat weed, there is no deer antlers, there is no, you know, no, no, nothing tonic. It's a 30, 50 grams, or I think originally 30 grams of Huang Bai Philodendron, 24 of Sharen, which is a particular kind of wild growing form of a, a momum, a type of cardamom that is not helping you to increase your appetite and, uh, digest food, but it's specifically, it's black in color, it's particularly used to, to help foods or Huang Bai to underscore its uh, kidney qi, or let's call it Shaoyang uh, ministerial fire consolidating thing. So that's particularly with a lot of these people, whether it's acute during COVID or chronically some kind of shuho, like some kind of deficiency fire that comes upward, but has a damp component in it. This is a great remedy. I use it for a lot of acute, like in during COVID, but also uh, chronic diseases with high blood pressure and autoimmune stuff. And where you don't want to go in there with like excess heat clearing things like lung dan sao or so, but you, you, this is sort of a very friendly way on the digestive system. It's not too cold. You've got this warming herb sharan in there, uh, but uh, I combine that very often with, you know, other uh, remedies. It's, it's, I had to learn about that. No teacher taught me that. That's through my contact in the last 15 years with a fire spirit school that used to use this remedy. Now they more into fuzi, but originally Zheng Qing'an this was a very important way to consolidate ministerial fire in kidney, kidney, kidney yang, actually, using cooling herbs. So if there's more of a heat, use it, use that way. And here you can, you know, I recommend you 
download or get for uh, free or some almost you know just a printing cost from classical pearls that manual that that has this description of what these remedies do uh, so you know stuff like mouth ulcers toothache uh, swelling in the face you know or red eyes uh, these kind of wetness in the swollen lips bad breath uh these kind of uh yeah you know so there is it's a very specific way of working with the kidney that doesn't use war warming herbs that might make things worse particularly if there is sort of deficiency heat symptoms okay um di huang is of course the one thing that we more familiar with um, literally called the yellow of the earth or bring the yellow back into the earth. Yellow, white is the color in cosmology of dispersed chi. Yellow is the, is the contracted chi. So concentrated jing chi that's below the surface of the earth. In the Tang Ye Jing, the decoction classic, this is classified as water within water. So that's winter within water, winter, storage within storage, stop with and stop. So this is my favorite way to calm down uh, autoimmune fire that's been been triggered, you know, right? Young tonics, you need to think about when there's under function. So you use cinnamon and things like that and ginger to stimulate more function when there's not enough, okay? Whereas Yin tonics is not when the patient is naturally not is, is saying I have dry skin and I'm tired. Uh, you use Di Huang. It's when there is over function. Yin tonic really means when your ability to contract the chi is deficient and the energy is kind of roaming around there wildly and doesn't know how to come back into a state of storage. So I'm using this herb. Uh, a lot for not just, you know, for moistening the kidneys as it's called, but this is the best herb for certain kind of autoimmune diseases, including, you know, people with asthma, but also people with metastasis in the lung who are like wheezing like an uh, asthmatic or in post COVID situations where like your whole nervous system is still inflamed and your lungs are short of breath. It's like, you know, you test negative repeatedly. So there is just, you know, your immune miming and fire has been traumatized and you want to find a way to bring it back into the box. That's what Di Huang does, okay? S side effect, of course, is if you're already spleen damp, then this is not your herb. You know, then the, qian, the feng shui dan we just discovered or, or the qian yang dan using fuzi would be much better because they dry damp. But when the person is not damp and if anything dry, this is a fantastic herb if you use it at the right time. You know, I think it's overused in modern times, used wrongly, but in, 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 in COVID, I find it found it both in acute as well as in chronic situation very good. Like Shen Chi Wan, right here, you can see the, the Di Huang on the lower right. Here's some picture I took in Henan. This is a grows close to Mount Song, by the way. How the when when the Di Dao Yao Cai is uh, uh, when you get the herb from the right region, it has that so-called chrysanthemum heart, like literally cut the the, the 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 fruit or the root open. It has this kind of signature chrysanthemum structure in there. Uh, uh, that that the same plant and a different plant will uh, in a different location will not have. So it's the particular uh, very important Chinese herbalism is the sourcing of a particular herb from a specified location and then harvest it at a specified time. Um, so like lots of people not only having heart problems in post COVID situation, but they go into kidney failure or they have a kidney problem or high creatinine or something. So Shen Chi Wan led by 24 grams of Di Huang uh, is in this case, very good way to go. Of course, together with blood movers and together with 
with other herbs that are uh, possibly still antiviral, like lightning pearls or yin xiao san or something like that. But I found uh, like the inclusion of di huang during acute COVID as well as uh, then uh, particularly if anxiety and insomnia and heart palpitations are involved can be, and of course, anything with kidney uh, values going astray, this can be uh, very useful. I think in beginning of COVID, of course, some of it due to this horrible drug remdesivir, uh, but there were so many people dying two years ago in New York City, all these horrible images, a lot of those people died of kidney failure, right? So it's, uh, some of it was drug induced, some of it was, uh, you know, COVID itself, not just harming the blood vessels, but, uh, but the kidneys. Shen Shi Wan, of course, you know, normally treating geriatric conditions, etc. But you should think of it as, as a remedy to anchor Mingyuan fire uh, in Mingmen deficient people if there is more dryness than there is. And finally, you know, there are other remedies that also I started producing like water pearls as sort of a Shen Qi Wan. Uh, da Huang Zhe Chong Wan is a Jingwei remedy that you can't get uh, elsewhere that I started producing in classical pearls has all these rare ingredients, but it's right next to Shen Qi Wan in the exhaustion chapter, Xu Lao chapter in the Jingwei. And that's what post COVID patients are. They are exhausted. Uh, and, you know, because the battery is leaking and still there is this flaring and blood stasis at the same time. So this is a remedy that treats all of these problems, post-epidemic exhaustion with blood stasis and deficient uh, deficiency all in one. So I love uh, adding a little bit of that to Thunder Pearls and, uh, and, and, and maybe a Bukurum formula or so, particularly when people have a tendency to clot or have blood clots amazing remedy. Also good for cancer, by the way. Uh, has only little Di Huang here, Xue Fu Zhui Tang. Also lots, everybody's microclotting right now, 95% exposure to uh, spike protein nowadays. Um, so everybody has heavy legs, has, you know, shortness of breath, has kind of feels tired all the time. Blood movement is important. Should Di Huang, by the way, in raw form is considered a blood mover. So in Xu Fu Zhu Yitang, drive out stasis in the mansion of blood decoction, which is so important right now, either that one or the Da Huang Zhe Chung one, both of them having Di Huang, uh, this one less, but nevertheless, um, the Di Huang is not just a, you know, certainly not a kidney tonic, not a not a moisturizer, but is a drawing down excess Mingmen fire energy, redrawing it into the box of the Mingmen, and at the same time, uh, cooling things down and moving the blood that will stagnate easily. Together, it does that with Taoren, Honghua, Dangui, uh, Chuanxiong, of course, but um, Di Huang is an interesting herb, you know. Um, so here's the many diseases that Xue Fu Zhu Yitang can treat. You can read through that. Uh, you know, this is another Di Huang based remedy, but really the lead here is Shan Yao, which is also in Shen Qi Wan. Uh, and then more for, you know, the body pain. I use this remedy that we also made in classical pearls called Shen Xian Du Shu Dan, more for arthritic patient, but also for this fibromyalgic post-COVID uh, patient is another way to anchor ministerial fire uh, using moderate amounts of Di Huang uh, if you don't want to use Go High. Um, um, Glacier pearls, more of the wheezing ministerial fire freaking out when people have lung cancer, wind more when people have hay fever and asthma, but it's all using the Di Huang to kind of anchor that uh, autoimmune fire. Uh, last not, but not least, before we go into the question, I wanna go into Fuzi, 
uh, is of course and not just a warming herb but uh, as we know uh, when we look closely in the classics and underscored by Zheng Qian and the fire spirit school as it still exists particularly if you combine it with Sharen as in the remedy Qianyang Dan here is Lu Chong Han the current lineage holder of the fire spirit school in Chengdu retired uh, university uh, professor, but most importantly, you know, sort of like uh, this was like I think uh, fifteen years ago or so, um, uh, visiting him. So it, your foods is a very special herb that's planted at the winter solstice, the wild seedlings, and then harvested. Right now, today is the day when it's being brought to market. Uh, harvested the two days before the summer solstice, so only absorbing the pure yang qi between the winter and the summer solstice, and therefore is directly affecting Mingmen fire, but it's not only heating it or making heat uh, deficient heat symptoms worse, but in certain yang deficient people who tend to also be damp, uh, it draws that fire downward uh, into the box. So this Fuzi, particularly in combination, which by the way, here's how Fuzi looks when it comes out of the ground. It's like coffee. It doesn't like to be grown, exposed directly to the sun. So they grow it in the shade in Jiangyou here next to corn. And then it comes out of the ground, it looks like this. In the middle, that's what we call wutou. Um, Fuzi means the two things that are attached to the side. That's what Fuzi means. Uh, it looks like that, of course, it also is uh, signifies it's, it's like a natural uh, manifestation or symbolic for looks like a male uh, genitalia, uh, which again reinforces sort of uh, in the ancient symbolic uh, mythologically oriented mind uh, that this substance is, of course, tonifying the young. Um, which it does, but it's primarily it's something that dries spleen damp. Uh, middle and lower burner damp. Number one, it warms the fire of Mingmen, but something that is really due to the efforts of the Fire Spirit School and Nearly Hong, who dug out that school and brought it to our attention, is that in combination, like in Jiangyou, it, uh, only there it does grow this big. Um, and then, of course, you got to the problem with foods is it, it gets harvested and brined, otherwise it'll rot in the middle of the summer immediately. So they brine it, but then in the end, uh, once it's processed and cut, you need to wash all of that salt out. Otherwise, uh, you know, a lot of the so-called foods of toxicity is actually due to improper handling uh, of the brine. And uh, a lot of the purveyors like to keep the salt in it because it makes the foods a heavier. It's an expensive commodity, right? So to really wash out 100% of the brine, you need to do it again and again and again and again, like many, many, many times. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have some salty thing that's going to increase rather than decrease your high blood pressure. And you don't want that, right? But here's, right, here's the cardamom. Uh, uh, plant, but uh, the growing in Yunnan, Burma mostly. Um, so here, Qianyang Dan is this remedy from the fever school that they love using along feng shui. They have feng shui Dan on one side and Qianyang Dan on the other. They both, that's the both ways to draw down ministerial fire. Qianyang Dan, if there is more obvious heat, that's visible at the surface, either in the tongue or the lip or the pulse. And Qianyang Dan is when the person has a fatter tongue and less redness in the tongue, uh, etc., and is overall has a more yang deficient constitution. But both of these we need to look at, you know, that Futsu is recharging your battery and recharging the ability of Mingmen fire to seal itself in and not leak upwards. So if used correctly, which means not in teeny little amounts like one gram or three grams or six grams, but sort of 15 grams upwards, 15, 18 is enough. I think I use it that way 
uh, they uh, in China, the Fire Spirit School, they start with 30 and end with 200. <coughs> I think that's not necessarily used that much, but if you use the right food so that's processed in the right way, however, uh, and then uh, of course you got to boil it long enough. It 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 it'll it'll have that sinking, you know, because the more you use, the more it helps you sink down and consolidate that yang qi. In Shen Qi Wan, we of course have a combination of foods and di huang, you know, and the dryness of the foods is helping you to digest the di huang better and not develop damp, you know, so. Uh, other so we using in autoimmune conditions which always involve uh, fire our own immune fire roaming through the body uh, um, um, there I, I use these formulas that are dihuang based that are philodendron based and that aconite based a lot, you know, so, um, but time has passed quickly and we almost here at the end and I want to give you some opportunity and make some comments, give me some feedback and ask me some questions if you uh, have any. Okay, anyone have any questions? You can type it in the chat box and raise your hand. Okay, no one has any questions. Hi there, I have a question. Okay, so um, regarding the foods uh, that uh, I see that uh, your company has in granules, uh, is um, have you ever thought about maybe carrying the raw herb uh, uh, of the 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 yin tian of the of the food there? Is that a consideration that you had? Um, something that you would consider? Yeah, that's a good question. Definitely consider that. And um, it's just due to new laws in China and due to more stricter import laws for some reason. The important you would actually know better than me what's changed in recent years since you are a purveyor uh, of both granules as well as crude herbs but it's it's more difficult to export and import certain herbs and it's much easier to export extracts for reasons on the chinese side right. and um i'm getting asked by the australians and here also to import the the foods are, but it's it's also you know it's it gets more expensive if you are um, you have so much more weight and and uh, right now you know like the the air shipment cost has increased like 10, 10 times with you know like a ticket to China as you know is in ten thousand dollars or more for a regular economy seat because there are hardly any flights. It's it's and so the freight costs have increased too. Of course, you can boat ship, but then it sits like in LA on the West Coast. And and uh, I remember Yaron Seidman had, of course, he probably was labeling something not quite uh, right there. His person in China, and there there was a shipment of raw fruits that was uh, confiscated in New York, and then he stopped importing it. And so I didn't feel like I wanted to get involved in that business since we are uh, mostly, you know, you was selling these compounded remedies um, that we then, you know, boil into powders pretty much right away to preserve freshness also. Um, but it's, I, I keep getting asked and it's good that you express your interest. I'll, I'll keep asking people I have in ground in China as long as we can get it out of there. I'm not averse to that. Of course, it requires also storage space here and things like that. So uh, it's, I don't want to be in the business where I need to rent like a whole garage to store like huge sacks of fruits or so. And since it's definitely a, a specialty item, it's not like everybody uses that all the time. But um, yeah. 
I see another question in the chat. Uh, why did I translate Jyotva and a spiraling source chi? Is because I like to go in the most ancient meaning of the character. So Jyotva originally along the lines of this Jyotva in a chapter in the Neijing means emanating in spiraling fashion from a center. That's sort of the original, you know, um, so I kind of, it's not how it normally gets translated, but I like to excavate these most ancient kind of meanings or so we then get stuck sort of in the, just the medical realm and <clears throat> the, 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 uh, I mean, Jure can also mean, you know, that spiraling source chi is like a spark plug and it kind of, you know, we have this, Duan means to cut off, right? So when we move forward, you know, all of a sudden we get this momentum usually and then after New Year's, right, a gallbladder time, I got to clean the house, I got to make a New Year's resolution, I got to do something different, we get this kick in the rear end, right, gallbladder 30, Huan Tiao, which literally means it's that round, empty space out of which comes this jump, making us jump forward energy. So there it is again, this constant tour de force. We could go also through the uh, point names of the gallbladder channel is this kind of spiraling force energy that jumps out from this empty space uh, that it is aligned with in, 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 the, in the empty galactic center there. Um, and uh, Duan means to cut yourself off, you know, so in order to move forward, you need to free yourself of all of these old patterns, old trauma, old memory, and old toxins in the body. Uh, so that's what the winter solstice is, is the is a new beginning, the triple warmer in the tenth months of the year, that's hexagram two uh, on the whole map, that's, that's the end of the chi that starts circulating at the winter solstice and goes on its yearly journey and it ends in the 10th month and it starts in the 11th month. So this kind of starting energy, walking forward energy is again and again in the symbols that describe the gallbladder and the 11th month of the year and the midnight hour actually as well are labeled with those kind of symbols uh, like that. Thomas, any other questions you see or? I, I don't see anything on my end. So maybe with that, we'll conclude. And um, on behalf of the group, Heiner, thank you very much uh, for uh, being generous with your time and your knowledge. And I just want to express uh, our appreciation, not only for tonight, but also for the good work that you do in the profession. So it's really appreciated and we need more people like you in the profession. <laughs> So thank, thank you, you very much. much, Thomas. Much thank appreciated. Thank all of you for your attention and coming together here in this intimate setting. Um, I apologize for you know taking really the material from that we could talk years about and try and squeeze it too ambitiously into an hour and a half, but I hope there was the one or the other piece that because this is in the end what's you Chinese medicine uh, is the knowledge is out there but as practitioners as well as as scholars and as teachers we need to rediscover that knowledge for ourselves so that's my hope is as I was talking or you know or as you listen to other people that something in you gets triggered that you go like wow I'm I didn't think about that and then you mill it around and you take it into the clinic and so that's what these kind of talks are about is, is is not to kind of you know stuffing the goose and giving you some data that's in a handout it's about stimulating some thought processes in you that takes the knowledge you already have but bring it something new comes into there and is set in motion so I hope uh, the one or the other thing I said today uh, to do that. So thank you very much and uh, see you in another time, another place. Uh, you all be well. Happy solstice. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right, good night, everyone.